everybody. It's that catchy theme song again, which means it must be time for another fact-filled, fast-paced fall publishing webinar. I am Chris Bates, editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazines and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we tackle today's topics. You see it there on your screen, I hope, Plants with Personality for landscapers. Now, in today's webinar, we're going to hear from a professional landscape designer about how she meets the various and sundry demands from her uh, very diverse client base, and we're going to get a good look at the wide range of seasonal color aid items that uh, Ball Horticultural Company offers to the landscape trade and that she really likes to use. Um, now, I do want to mention, because uh, it may not have been quite clear in the uh, description, that uh, in today's webinar, we're going to focus primarily on seasonal color as opposed to, say, your basic foundation plants, trees and shrubs and things. And I, I clarify because uh, if you're looking for the hottest new uh, uh, maple or uh, boxwood cultivar, you're going to be disappointed. I uh, just want to be clear on that. Uh, however, we will be looking at doing a second webinar this fall that will, that will cover the blooming woody ornamental side of uh, landscape design. So that said, let's get back to our experts, shall we, who have joined me actually right here in the Ball Publishing Broadcast Studios. And first up is our uh, landscaper. She is Melissa Sherb, Senior Account Manager for Woodlawn's Landscape Company of beautiful Mundelein, Illinois. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, Chris. How are you? Thanks I'm, for having me. I'm great. Normally, I'd have to ask, where are you? And usually, the person says, oh, I'm on the beach in San Diego or something. But uh, you're stuck with me right here in the Ball Publishing Broadcast Studio. No beaches, people. <laughs> now, now, tell me real briefly about, about Woodlawn's Landscape Company. Woodlawn's Landscape Company is a small commercial landscape company uh, located in Mundelein, Illinois. We we do work all around the Chicagoland area, and my primary focus is in the downtown Chicago urban market of the grand old city of Chicago. Oh, that's going to be a lot of fun. It is fun. It's my favorite place. And I'll tell you, Chicago is colorful during it is. the summer. We and are. So you're responsible for part of that. I, I try to be. I try to be. <laughs> nice work. All right, and our, our second expert, uh, colorful in his own right, Mr. Jeff Gibson. He is the business manager for Ball Landscape. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here in these fabulous <laughs> Ball Publishing Studios. Palatial, aren't they? It is palatial. The, you can almost hear the echo uh, <laughs> off of the 12-foot ceilings. Now, I've always wondered what you do around here. So <laughs> what is it that a landscape business manager does anyway? Well, the official role is essentially a marketing function. I like to tell folks that it's a dating service, Chris. So you my, tell more and more, do tell. <laughs> my job is to connect the professional landscape trade with the commercial greenhouse grower for seasonal color and vice versa. And that seems so straightforward, but amazingly, that is oftentimes not necessarily the case. So if I can somehow facilitate that along the way, that's my job. And that's how you and Melissa became friends. That is exactly how we became friends. It's complicated. It was <laughs> Not the dating service thing. Oh, oh, I thought you, I'm sorry. I, I know Jeff's married. Uh, she's been on panels before, and I think that's actually the first time we met. I can tell you we're going to have fun today, having sat with these uh, these kids for the last couple of hours. So hang on to your landscaping hats. And there I am, uh, Chris Bate is editor of, you know, those things that I do. Anyway, um, the nice thing is I'm not having to worry about if our, our uh, remote guests get disconnected this time, which always takes a couple of weeks off my, off my life every time I do that. <laughs> now, a couple of housekeeping things. We've already got a question. Um, nice work, Randy. He, he used the Q&A area. You can also use the chat area. He's asking, is this uh, recorded for later viewing for those who aren't able to make this? Of course, he is in this, uh, but but yes, it uh, it will be recorded. Hang on a second, I'll tell you where that is. But yes, if you have any questions as we go along, use either the Q and A area or the chat area as you prefer. And if they're uh, pertinent to what we're talking about at the time, we'll cover them. If not, we'll pick them up at the end. And if they're still unanswered questions, we'll give you uh, a way to get those answered. Yes, Randy, it will be archived in case you have to uh, cut out earlier or you get disconnected or a customer comes in or what have you. All of our webinars get archived at fallpublishing.com slash webinars. Uh, conveniently, the pl same place you signed up for it. So there you go. Now, that said, you guys ready to go? We Alrighty. are. Ready. All right. Well, take it away. Well, uh, 
as part of the role that I serve here at Ball, a big chunk of my time is spent out in the field working with the professional landscape trade and with the commercial growers that serve them. And something that seems to always bubble to the top is this question. Because at the end of the day, it's ultimately, especially in the seasonal color business, all about who you need to wow. So let me pose that question to Melissa. Melissa, who is it that you need to wow? At the end of the day, I think we all need to wow our clients. And for me, my clients are commercial clients, their residents, their tenants, their business owners, their individual homeowners. And at the end of the day, it's wowing the client is the most important thing for seasonal color. Right, and so we're gonna come back to both the color aspects, individual items, but we're also gonna dwell on the on the personalities that we need to sell to, the very ones that you just mentioned. So I thought maybe a good way to set all this up with Chris's help is, is to kind of delve into landscape trends. And as we were preparing for this, you shared with me something that I thought just was bang on to set the tone for the discussion. Well, yes, Jeff, I feast your eyes on this lovely email that I received on January 4th, note it was sent December 17th to one of, um, from one of my clients. If you notice, she did refer to me as her favorite landscaper, just saying. But, <laughs> Don't um, they all? Well, I'd like to say so. Um, a couple things, you, you know, we can read it quickly, but a few things that were jump out at Jeff and I as we were talking about this is our, my client says, I have no money for plant care. Oh boy, well that's an issue. And then one of the probably more striking things is that they wanted to add back in some perennials um, to reduce costs over the seasons. And um, also the, probably the number, number one line that reached out at me was, I do not want the same color stuff we did last year. I would like to switch it up and do something very different. And I think as landscapers and as Growers, this is something we're always having to wrap our brains around. And basically, we have to mind read our clients and figure out what is it that they want for the upcoming season and do it in a timely manner. Absolutely. I hear that commonly refrained all over the country. So to sort of sum that up, that letter couldn't have been more appropriate. These are the trends that I'm seeing on the national scale. So perennials versus annuals, or the combination of perennials and annuals. So per annuals are maybe losing some ground to perennials, and that's, that's certainly a trend. Bigger bang for the buck, and you've got some excellent examples of how you have done that for some of your commercial clients. This idea of multi-season plantings, uh, it's, uh, a lot of that is actually related to client budgets, and we'll come back to that in the middle of the presentation here, and how the time frames are condensing. That's probably the most, the largest issue that our commercial landscape growers are having to contend with at this exact time of year. So this is bang on the busiest time of the year for ball shipping product to customers and the busiest time of the year for the growers getting started in their production process. So. One of the things uh, Jeff asked me right away was, you know, what kind of clients are, are you getting? And this was a really interesting thing that happened to me. I got a call this July, a new manager, new property manager, I'm sorry, a, new, a property manager went to a new site, got there and sent me these two top photos and was like, please help, Melissa, I need your touch on our entrance planters. And I, she was very upset. She said, we spent a lot of money on this planting at the top and it just is not, it's not working for us. Um, so as I approached on the world famous Wacker Drive, I came upon these stunning green displays of palms and sweet potato vine. And the same day we went out, we, I located some plant material and the bottom two photos are those planters installed on day one. And as you can see, we used the same budget she had previously and just wowed it out, bigger bang for buck, planted bigger material, instant gratification, and needless to say, their clients re-signed for next year already, and they're very happy with their plantings. So bigger bang for the buck by getting to uh, larger plants. Uh, let's see some other examples of that. Well, one of the things we joke with in the Midwest is that there's the incredible shrinking plant syndrome. 
not only do plants not love our cold June temperatures sometimes, they also, um, when they go in, people are like, ah, they looked great and now they look smaller or whatever. I, several years ago, changed from using a more traditional smaller flat, a 606 or a, mm -hmm. even a 1204 back way in the day, mm -hmm. to what we call an 1801 or a three and a half inch cell pack. Right. Um, and I had a client in 2014 call me. I had just gotten to the site and they're like, look what we have. And I said, well, you know, we can work with this. We have Vinca installed. And I was like, have you ever used a Begonia Whopper, Begonia Big? And she's like, no. So we went and booked, we went ahead and found some 1801 Begonias. We were able to plant them in the middle photo. And by the middle of the season, um, the final right photo, just a, such a better display. By using that 1801, my guys were able to install them quicker. There's mm -hmm. less plants and let me say bigger plants time saver, and honestly, client pleaser. Who wouldn't want the planting on the right? Yeah, as a general trend across the country, that's what I'm seeing too. I mean, gone are the days, you know, 72 packs used to be the case. Those are long, ancient history, especially when it comes to landscape. So the, because of the very reasons that you just identified, they fill in faster, get bigger quicker, and you get better client appeal. That's Plus, true. I would also argue that the faster they develop, the better the plants are gonna be able to withstand the adverse conditions that oftentimes come later in the summer. Absolutely. That's a great example. So again, um, I had a client loved her Vinca, and um, every year, Vinca, 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 and finally I was like, we really, really need to do something. So I said, hey, I can spend the same dollar amount and get a bigger bang for your buck. And so what we did was, bef boom, I mean, check that out. We just switched it out to, uh, I believe this is Begonia Whopper, um, same planting bed, the photo's a little different direction, but before and after, and I just think so much more color. All It pulls great with all the reds on the sites. A lot of their markings on the sites are mm -hmm. red. And it, the same plant, you know, the same amount of plant material, just bigger bang for your buck. Bigger bang. Bigger and she didn't care that she didn't get bigger? Mm -hmm. She did not. Actually, ironically, they want this again. So they've already secured their plant material for next year, and I can't say enough about the Whopper Begonia and its performance value. And I have a few more slides here to show you just exactly how that looks. Again, every year, Vinca, Vinca, Vinca. Oh, can I do baby pink Vinca? Let me, oh, this year, I think that was cherry Vinca. Like Marsha, Marsha, oh, Marsha. Yeah. Yes, and indeed. Woof, woof. So, <laughs> boom. I mean, really, you can't get a better show than that. So Whopper Begonia intermixed with a Kimberly Queen fern that we actually held from spring and carried it over season to season, and the matching planter to boot. We have Whopper begonias in there. We have our awesome sun patients in there, uh, vegetative coleus, and just dollar for dollar, same price, same thing, but just such a better show. Such an attractive planter. Two more people on bicycles yeah. showed up to look at. <laughs> look at that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great example. How about this one? Again, you know what? Not a terrible planting. Very typical standard planting you'll see in Chicagoland area. Salvia and Vinca, and again, this, this actually is the same client as the other property, just a different property, and mm -hmm. we just did a little switch up. And um, she it, did love her vinca, didn't she? She, oh boy, yeah, loved it. And then, as you can see, in the same bed, same planting, and that's with a whopper uh, bronze leaf red. And I mean, that to me is stunning. It plays really well, nice with others, with the perennial um, Carl Forrester. There's some knockouts and all kinds of things in there. And you can see that. That's on Damon Avenue. You can see it from a mile away. Absolutely. That 55 mile an hour color that we're all looking looking to get. Yeah. How about this one? Well, let's, yeah. That's before the bang. Lots to work with there. Yeah, lovely. And then we just did a couple switch outs. We used a bigger plant material. Wow. And I, I mean, Pictures are worth a thousand words. Those are, we went from four inch plants to six inch plants, uh -huh. less varieties and just higher impact. Less variety. There's actually less varieties in that planter, if you can believe it, than there were in the other one. And I mean, that's just a stunning show. That was probably end of July. Same site as the other begonias and what a, what a showstopper. And the same budget. Same budget, same budget, absolutely. And I mean, you, <laughs> yeah, and they're thrilled. Resigned are ready for next year. Again, before the bang, <laughs> a couple intermixes and just after the bang. A um, couple of simple color palettes, you know, picking really strong performers. This is the Whopper Begonia in the planter. I, if mm -hmm. you look on the left and on the far right, sensational. That's Sun Patient, Compact Orange, Stunning, Coleus. 
palladium there is in there a little cana that even got swallowed up by how big the plantings were so um maybe this year i'll have to put in a taller centerpiece very lush looking yeah indeed. Awesome. <clears throat> um again these actually are a competitor I'm not, and i was driving by and i was just taking a look at their plantings these are a planter you see a lot and often in chicagoland and um i personally was a little underwhelmed i think that you know there's ways to do planters and then this would not be <laughs> my first way but I think if you look at the next photo just in the same planters it's almost hard to even know that those are the same the same things going on so wow. again we pre-book our stuff we were custom growing our plant material trying to get in you know we we, we grow it sites I've already have my mom's booked for you know we booked them good love you yeah uh we booked them actually i'm doing a lot of the grape berry this year so we booked them really early and that's how you get like the better show you're not you know playing with pieces you're playing with what you already have yeah that's like you know, we'll come back to that refrain again and again and again the idea of pre-booking with your grower that's the ideal situation here in here in the Chicago land market where our planting time is condensed because, you know, basically you start in mid-May after frost and it's mm -hmm. got to be done by, what, no later than the end of June, probably mid-June. So you have six weeks of solid install and then those plants are expected to last all the way until your fall turn, which is clearly these would be the fall turn. Yeah. Those are beautiful. I noticed something else about your designs. You're using a few not overwhelming numbers of, but a few good plants in, uh, in different differing combinations. Can yeah. you talk to that? Well, I, I think that the, probably the best way to do things is to come up with palettes yourself and mm -hmm. come up with, you know, a set scope and a set grouping of plantings that you're going to work and rework. So plants that play well with others, mm -hmm. um, plants, as my mom would say, plants that play nice in the sandbox. <laughs> and so we what i have done is i've worked with um some of my growers to, to to establish that planting scheme ahead of time and then sell it in turn sell it to my clients yeah that's great that's great advice so how about uh, the idea of multi-season plantings i'm hearing more and more and more about that i'm working more and more on things like this where i can save my clients money um although not every landscapers trying to do that i think there are clients that if you want to keep them and keep them around you need to come up with planting ideas that will work from season to season in this case we re we installed the lobularia on the left which is the purple lower plant as well as we use some kimberly queen ferns in the planting and then it this is we those we kept in and then the photo you see on the right is when that planting installation went in. That went in in mid-May, end of May. So that's how well those lobularia had grown in. And we wound up actually keeping the lobularia and Kim Queens all the way through the fall season. What a great so we idea. were able to shrink mm -hmm. the overall planting space and just make a few changes. We brought in the Whopper begonia, which did really well, and um, some of the Iapameas. And you'll see those Iapameas later in a, in a photo that they just are uh, a rock star performer. So what did you say the left left planting was done? I see two of them. So that's, there. yeah, that's early spring. So that would yeah. have been like April, let's say 15th, and then this would have been maybe May 30th or so. Um, so in that time, the lobularia really took off. This is day one, the planting. Both are day one planting, just so you know. And the lobularia did, uh, um, the lobularia just took off and really did, a, was a great performer. Um, that's great. That's a, that's a good example. And we wanted to circle back to my favorite landscaper. Oh, wait, no, that's just me. Um, <laughs> but we did want to circle back to this email again, kind of reiterating, you know, why these folks do not want, their, I, they always want change. They constantly want new things. And it's just a reminder as landscapers that you have to set up your, um, you have to set up your annual budget and you have to set up your plant schemes ahead of time. And you can do that by incorporating all annuals, annual pallets, along with perennial and perennial pallets and intermixing things. So I just wanted to circle back with that email. Yeah, and it's a very good segue to some of the trends that I'm seeing as well, which I think are covered there on the next slide after that. That's sort of, re we'll, we'll come back to that. This, this concept of time frames condensing, you kind of hinted at it, and that I hinted at it as well. This is what our growers are seeing out there. So let's let's move to the next slide that kind of gets at that issue. So I kind of characterized the 
things that are affecting design, landscape color in particular, well, landscape design in general, are the following characteristics. Certainly the clients, uh, we've touched on that. You saw that in the letter that we were just looking at, the expectations of, you know, I give you my order in January for planting that has to ensue in May. If I may interrupt, one of the things I tell my clients, and I think it's a great trick, I say that the landscaping world is just like the, the fashion industry. We're six months ahead. Mm -hmm. So while you're planning, yep. you know, your spring trip, we're already planning our fall moms. Yep. So I think it's a great little selling technique if you let your residents and homeowners and everyone know that – you need to be <laughs> a way ahead of the trend. We are thinking of six it. months ahead six of the months. game. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's unfortunately that's kind of a rarity that knowledge. Cause unfortunately, yeah. Most because and that gets to the point there on the far right of the screen, which is what's happening on the supply side. So it's true universally across the country, the growers are doing a lot less speculation growing. So that to the end that a few years back, I don't know if you remember this, but begonias were short. Oh, so, absolutely. So yeah. growers are really, really cutting it down, uh, the amount of specs. So this idea of, well, we'll just wait till the spring and book what's available. And, uh, we, you know, the old adage of you get what you get if you don't plan ahead. Absolutely. That's actually becoming more and more true. So the growers themselves are doing this sort of narrow and deep thing. So if you really are interested in a new variety that you see here in this presentation or you find along the way, you really need to work with your grower to get that growing for you specifically. Of course, the other things that are affecting the landscape trade, housing and the commercial trends, the regulations and all that. You know, jumping ahead to what's going on at the commercial level, which are your clients, um, was it the higher expectations? You saw that. Keeping the tenants happy. The good news is that most of the leasing rates, the vacancy rates are down. Leasing is up, which means that they have the budgets. And if you're in the north, where we've had actually less no, not necessarily true for the northeast, as much, but there has been less snow work, which may actually result in more dollars being available for color installs or enhancements this coming spring Absolutely. and summer. Uh, so a lot of the contractors are planning on that. Other clients that you might be dealing with, or I think you are dealing with, uh, flip to the next screen there, the, the rise of the HOA, the HOA, the Homeowners Association, Look at Carol. Look at Look her. Look at Carol. She is throwing it at us. And Carol <laughs> is very, very typical for the type of person that is on the board of many of the homeowner associations. She has a little bit of knowledge. Uh, maybe she's already a seasoned gardener. Maybe she's retired and moved into the HOA to, to downsize the house a little bit. But what most people don't realize is that HOAs now comprise nearly 50% or more of the housing in the United States and are growing. So publicly managed, professionally managed landscapes are rising. So there's a business opportunity for the landscape trade out there in this. Um, and kind of an analogous to that, the next group would be the condo associations, which are pretty much along the same lines, with the exception that their spaces may actually be tighter. And so they're looking, uh, looking for very specific varieties that can fit these compact spaces. The good news for them, generally the boards of at least condo associations are doing a good job, or at least the tenants assume so. And more to the point, they all believe that it adds to the enhanced property value because condos have a tendency to turn faster than single-family homes. Absolutely. So they want to keep that value up in the landscape. So Bob is dealing with a landscape like the next slide shows, Everything from spring to summer to fall and containers and everything everything amongst it. So that's where the landscape contractor comes in in uh, bringing forward plants. So the next group of uh, uh, that were probably most known is the residential homeowner. So here is Dave and Kathy, very typical, uh, recently retired. They, these folks still have the big suburban lawn, big suburban house. Um, matching outfits. <laughs> matching outfits, <laughs> yes. And uh, they have the money, which is the more important point for this conversation. So still true now, even though our Y generation is coming onto the scene in terms of home ownership, our boomers are the ones that are spending the money, both at the garden center level and absolutely at the professional landscaping level. So we've seen that in some of the statistics within the industry. These are the folks that are paying for landscapes. So as such, um, the overriding concern I hear the most about as I travel through the country, and you've probably experienced this here in Chicago even, that's water rich, I should say, 
is this concern over water in general. So the less use of it, the getting the water bills down, um, the middle point is really key for us as a plant breeding company. That plants are expected to look good with less water over a longer period of time. And if you're in the West, the public public visibility is a big deal. I mean, there's state regulations that are regulation regulating the use of water, but it also goes to what people believe in the landscape. The next slide kind of gets to that point. We do a lot of research work here at Ball with the professional landscape trade and growers. Um, I thought this was telling because again, it's kind of we intuitively may know this. But the big users of resources in terms of chemicals or water or fertilizer, of course, it's turf, but annuals comes into a pretty strong second beyond that. Kind of goes back to that, that last slide, you know, especially in California. So the annuals are getting thrown into the same bucket as turf, which is essentially becoming a disallowed or disapproved category. So for a company like ourselves, that means that we're getting into other product categories, barring shrubs and perennials and whatnot, things that we'll be talking about in the next webinar, which Chris alluded to, uh, uh, that those are the rising categories. This also is an indication of what we need to be doing on the breeding side. And so we'll go through some products here next. And so, so, so what we're seeing are the rise of new classes altogether in the landscape, stuff that you've already shown us in a lot of the slides, everything from New, new forms of impatience to dianthus as a summer crop to lantanas that uh, have a tendency to bloom longer and later, all of these things. So we'll, we'll just jump jump right in and Absolutely. I want to get your opinions and views on this as, as we move along. Um, so let's go to the next slide, Chris. Probably no singer, single best new product for landscape introduced in the last decade, I'd have to say, than Angelonia. Um, we offer a series from seed, one of the better ones from seed called Serenita, uh, in a range of different colors. And the pack shots that you see there is the Serena, the taller one, and then we introduce the Serenita, which is the shorter one. And let's flip to the next slide, Chris. That's what it does in the landscape. You made a comment about Yeah, that's about sensational. I think Serenita is a great front-facing plant. It comes in a lot of colors. Um, the purples, the pinks, the whites, it's very striking. And it flowers like that from the time I, when I get it from my grower, it's already in color. I'll have a couple of sprigs of color and it'll, it'll stay like that um, all the way through September when I start planting again. It's a wonderful, wonderful front facing plant. I think it's really great. And I also think it serves well to an intermix. It'll, it'll play with others. That's great. So the next slide kind of tells the tale of what we're on about at Ball. So we're breeding all forms of angelonia, tall ones, short ones, uh, large flowered ones, spreading types, um, which is kind of an underutilized class in the angelonia, but fantastic for landscape applications, uh, uh, basically to give growers and landscape contractors options. And what I think consumers like about this is it's got a bit of a perennial look to it. Yeah, it's absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, the upright habit, more of a knee high. Kind yeah, it of looks, and it looks good with other perennials. So it'll look great with, um, the alley and summer beauties of the world, calamanthas, the catmints, it looks great with grasses. It also um, reads sometimes, I've, I've had a client year after year plant it in front of their building and they think it looks, it, they, they think it stays very tight and, needy and neat and I think they like that. It looks very professional, if you will. Mm -hmm. I use the uh, Angelina Archangel in all my planters. So when I need a taller, a little more upright, um, little, color burst, little bigger yeah, flower. a little mm -hmm. bigger flower. That's really the one I go after. That's great. Here's another shot. Uh, Serenita Blue is the new one that's come in this year. And there's a nice combination of the raspberry and the white. The raspberry color is uh, particularly okay. striking in the landscape. So that's Angelonia. Uh, begonias, we've hit upon this already. The Whopper is probably the sig most significant um, introduction in recent years. Any color you want, as long as it's pink and Rose red. and red and pink and rose and red, uh, dark leaf or green leaf, but it does the job. So oh, you did can we mention they're coming pink and red? <laughs> pink and red. But you want to go meet the breeders after? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, and sure and the Valentine them. breeders of pink and red. I keep asking for like an orange. I know that there mm -hmm. we, you know, the white would be nice. White would be great. Yep. What would really be cool is if it came in a totally different color, but it's not happening yet. Um, however, it does. Again, it's a great companion plant. So you can put a red or a pink with almost any color of the rainbow. So and it does this, next slide, Chris. 
in the landscape. That's why it's I mean, the that's utilitarian. Amazing. Yeah. And this is goes to the bigger bang point body, that we yeah. were talking about earlier simply because it covers a lot of ground quickly. And so. those are almost knee high. So those would stand alone yeah. in a bed. You will see that bed from a million miles away. You could you'll see them when you drive through O'Hare Airport right. as on the you know on the approach. You will see them on all along Lakeshore Drive and you'll see them on Michigan Avenue. They'll handle a little sun and shade, yeah. and they're they're really fantastic. Last, last well into the season, Absolutely. even into the fall. Uh, the ones here on the ball grounds look great until mid-October, even. Okay, the next item up here is uh, called the Canova Series Canna. So Canna has sort of been a universally used plant for landscapes. It's very utilitarian. It can take really, really wet conditions or very, very dry conditions. The unique feature of this, of course, is it's seed grown. Most cannas are from bulbs and uh, have had a history with mm, virus uh, problems. Uh, this will not come with the virus. It is still susceptible to the virus, but it will not come with the virus. And uh, the fact that it's seed grown means that it's more readily available, more predictable, reliable supply, which makes it more useful for the landscape. There's four colors all together. Here the bronze leaf with scarlet and the yellow are shown. There's a red and a uh, 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 pink. Uh, these two colors are kind of standout items in the landscape, but uh, do uh, serve as a great centerpiece item for beds or containers. Yeah, I was just going to make a note. I had uh, the Canova series at a client who hit Every year she says, don't plant cane, I don't like them. Well, I snuck a few in, and now she's a believer. No, she so we are going to be growing um, the cane and canola. The yellow is a pretty, pretty yellow. It has this nice little lemony kind of undertone, and it's, and it's really, really sharp in the, um, in the, landscapes, in the landscape beds. Uh, that's great. Uh, there's a question that's just come in about diseases in the landscape. Uh, have you had to rotate plant families, especially for vinca, and would you like to plant marigolds, but afraid of a lot more maintenance due to deadheading. Uh, great question. Uh, uh, but you want to field that one? Yeah, I definitely think vinca, vincas, the wave, wave petunias, things like that, they do need to be on a rotation. So if you've planted and had a successful, great year with a petunia or vinca in a bed, I would highly, highly recommend switching that over into a new species, whether it's Angelonia, mm -hmm. which seems to be pretty, mm -hmm. a pretty strong fighter, coleus like we have up right now. Mm -hmm. um, any of the begonias would do well, and as far as I know, and play well with others. I, I know people say they have to plant marigolds and deadhead stuff. You know what? We have to pinch and deadhead everything. Everything takes mm -hmm. a little bit of maintenance. Um, I think if you're using the smaller head marigolds, it's less likely for it to be really visible. Mm -hmm. And if you have them intermixed, it's definitely way less visible. So if you wanted to intermix a marigold, let's say with like an Endurascape verbena or a lantana, that would be a great way to get a show. I saw a great, um, I believe it was a uh, marigold, uh, Tahitian, mar no, not Tahitian, the uh, Bonanza marigold mm -hmm. interplaying very well with um Angelonia, and it was a, a great stunner. But I would not consistently plant the same species of plant, really no matter what it is, year after year yeah. after year. We'll uh, come back to that in another slide here later in the in the uh, presentation. But so. that also falls under the heading of giving your customer something new every year. Yeah, because absolutely. your first letter said, yeah. I don't want the same stuff. And That's you know right. what? They, yeah. they don't want the same stuff. And so you got to be creative with that. So sometimes I'll go as simple as, well, you had pink last year. Let's pop it up with red or something like that. But again, you're the professional and you need to make sure that your client understands you want what's best for them and that you're going to plant the best species for them. Mm -hmm. I have people that I want super alpha and impatient and I'm like, you love the look, let's go to bounce. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, or you love that look, let's go a different direction. And, so, and make it sure your clients understand about rotation and disease prevention. Absolutely. Exactly. So oh, back, up, back on the coleus for a second. So there's, they basically come in two classes. There's the vegetative types and the seed types. And the vegetative types have been more or less selected for full sun use. Uh, they tend to be bigger uh, for the most part. And the drive for both types of coleuses is to get those that don't flower 
at all or flower very, very late. And these are some of the very best in that regard, the redhead, the wasabi, the slide that you were just on, Chris, the next one. That's, that's a great example of the use of intermixing the two. That's the redhead and the wasabi. The henna itself is a standout okay. variety just on its own if you're looking for that bronze tone. And there in the lower right-hand corner is the electric lime, that chartreuse color coleus that they're most known for with the uh, Sun Patients Lilac, a, a great combination. And going to the question that was down below about like the changing out of marigolds being messy, coleus is a great choice for a non-messy plant near features that you don't want to have a bit, bunch of mess or anything like that. So if you want a clean landscape coleus redhead, I, it rarely goes to flower. I mean, I have it in a lot of sites, and I won't see it to flower. So you have a lot less yeah. mess yeah. and a lot less work. And yeah. it's a beast. Yeah. It, it is a strong, strong <laughs> performer. It, it is. really is. Uh, here's a new one. This is the campfire coleus, the uh, first orange, or effectively the first orange, the really good orange color for the landscape. Uh, a little muted. Uh, this was a late-in-the-day photograph there on the right. But it is, it's a great one for uh, color in the landscape. Yeah, I used it in a couple different sites this year and found that that orange color is awesome. It looks great with purple, um, it looks great with blue, and it looks really great with yellows. And uh, there's a couple maybe examples later on. I think that's a really, really strong, strong performer. We use a little bit of it on our, on our back patio and containers, and I like it personally because it carries into the fall. I actually use it in containers as well yeah. near a pool, and yeah. the client loved it, absolutely loved it. Now, in the seed category for coleus, there's a range of stuff available. These are kind of all new uh, improvements. Uh, a lot of you might be familiar with the old Wizard series, which is still great, uh, but there's been upgrades with the seed ones, again, for that late flowering characteristic, and those are listed there as the Kong Junior uh, coleus there on the bottom. Those are some excellent suggestions. Um, we'll flip to the next slide on how the Kong Juniors actually look like in landscape. They're junior for leaf size, not junior for height, but junior for leaf size. And if it's a, a partial shade to shade condition, uh, the Kong Juniors are an excellent uh, option. And I was mentioning that I think coleus is hands down probably the most versatile plant. It's also very elegant. Mm -hmm. You a lot of times will get those HOA carols going, well, I don't want what everybody else has. <laughs> well, coleus is a great way to kind of tie it in, and she's like, but it doesn't flower. But who needs a flower when it looks that great all the time? So I think that um, coleus is probably one of my favorite plants to use in, in the shade, mm -hmm. as well as the sun. But you, I mean, that junior scarlet is just absolutely stunning, mm -hmm. and they would look very cool playing together or near each yeah, other. they would. It's an excellent choice. So another rising class for many breeders are uh, Ipomea. It's not a new class, but it's certainly that Technology of making them more compact is really what's at play here. We've got some photographs of this that you've done in the landscape later on. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back to that one, but a great new selection in the solar power series. Uh, that question earlier about diseases in the landscape, we sort of use that, uh, use this slide a lot to talk about wave petunias. Uh, sort of the wave petunia commandments, thou shalt not plant and replant, thou shalt rotate, and thou shalt not overwater. The single biggest issue with wave petunias has nothing to do with the waves, it has everything to do with water in the beds. So the vast majority of petunia plantings over the years have been basically overwatered, which opens them up to a whole bunch of pests and diseases. So that said, let's put the next slide. There's probably no better starting point for wave petunias than the original wave purple, and we still sell a lot of it uh, because it's so tough for the landscape. Hands down, wave purple is my favorite of the wave series. It's short, it's tight. Mm -hmm. For a client that has a lower budget, no irrigation, doesn't like to water. Right. <laughs> well, 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 well. This is an amazing this, this plant. Is the plant. You don't really get much better than that. The next photograph is the uh, that's the Easy Wave series in sequence. It's on the top of a parking garage in full sun, unirrigated beds. That was the best petunia planting I think I'd seen in a long, long time. So again, the issue with a lot of the petunias. Are, are making sure that they're getting into beds that aren't already contaminated and really watching the water carefully. And putting petunias into a container is a great way to avoid those issues. That's true. Um, they will 
they will, you know, they don't need as much water. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a container, they can handle it more. They, they are heavy feeders. I do they love are. an easy they wave, though. Feeders. And I still love some of the um, old, I still love that original Petunia Wave Purple. I actually put it in a lot of my containers. But I would be less inclined to, to bed it down, but I would absolutely bed it down in a bed that I've prepared, that I've prepped properly with, you know, the proper amendments, and that's, you know, irrigation free. Quick question here. Um, Sherry says, we don't plant petunias in the landscape in the south. They die from diseases. Yeah. You think that's a rotation issue, too many years of uh, uh, it's certainly planting? It certainly can be. We've, uh, Ball has actually been doing a great deal of research with Clemson University over the years, and there is some evidence that there is a nasty cycle of pathogen buildup in beds over time, and it's uh, vinca. It can be as is as equally susceptible. So if you have this rotation of petunias, vincas, petunias, vincas, you're actually exacerbating the problem. So you need to rotate into all together different crops, some of which we're going to get into here later. The other question was where this was taken. This was actually in the Midwest. This was in Chicago. Um, and as I said, these are un unirrigated beds, which I think is uh, which is uh, a great one. Uh, the tidal wave, someone is mentioning the silver tidal wave as being right. a uh, superstar. It is. The tidal wave series are the most overlooked petunia out there. They and, are and, fantastic and for landscape. A Texas superstar. Yeah, it is a Texas superstar. Well, yes, everything's bigger in Texas. That. Thank you, Keith, for that. <laughs> so let's keep moving here. Uh, this also is a really, really stellar addition to the crops for landscape. This is an interspecific impatience. Our version, Ball's version, Ball Floor Plants version, I should say, is the bounce. Uh, we have a compact version, bounce, and the bigger version, big bounce. They are a New Guinea impatient crossed with another species to get improved plant performance. They are the closest thing to a guard, to an impatience while they're in up, but it doesn't get the downy mildew. That's the big difference. That's the big improvement. The sun patients are in that same league. They don't get the downy mildews. They've been around for a number of years. They've got an excellent color in the, in the orange and a number of other really stellar uh, colors as well. So the interspecific impatience. The other thing that I think a lot of folks overlook is that a unique characteristic is they stay in flower in high night temperatures. Whereas regular New Guineas can oftentimes go out of bloom, these New Guinea interspecifics stay in bloom through high night temperatures. So if you're in the deep south, that's an important characteristic. And even in Chicago, we had a summer two or three years ago down on Michigan Avenue. Everyone planted the old big, vigorous mm -hmm. varieties, and they weren't blooming. Weren't and blooming. so these, we've all, a lot of us have changed to this compact series and or the bounce. I used a ton this year, and no problems with the night temperatures and things like that. So I'm glad you brought that point up because a lot of times I've had been asked that, why are they not blooming? So I think that's a, a really yes. great point. Very uh, good point. Tanya wants to know how waves uh, compare to uh, vegetative petunias in the landscape. And we're not addressing any vegetative Petunias, yeah, petunias uh, yeah. We have a number of vegetative petunias. <clears throat> of course, we sell a bunch, uh, are, and many, many of them are excellent. Um, uh, Melissa kind of alluded to it. A lot of the vegetative types, for whatever reason, have a history of being used in containers often. Absolutely. Uh, proven winners, uh, super tunias, are, are excellent in containers. Their uh, bubblegum pink is kind of a standard for the industry. Uh, your question is how waves compare to them. Uh, I would say very favorably. Um, the Certainly the cascading nature of the wave purple uh, as Melissa was alluding to, can be used in containers. That's a that's a, a good comparison. Uh, but certainly you can't go wrong with a lot of the vegetative petunias. In fact, while floor plant is introducing a, a, a new vegetative petunias this coming spring that will uh, uh, get a lot of people's attention. We'll so be talking about that more. But they may come down to cost or packaging, because often you don't find them smaller true. than a six inch or, right. or, or a basket, whereas waves are more readily in packs. In packs, that's exactly um, right, Chris. Yeah, that's but good if you talk to your grower, they may be able to work with you on that. In advance. You in advance. This is a conversation that they want in October, people, or maybe even <laughs> September, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so for folks that were asking questions about what to plant instead of petunias, here's a good suggestion. This is the Endurascape series verbena. They're available in a number of colors. Uh, some a couple of which we'll show you next, but they are closest in comparison to the old homestead. Uh, they don't get the mildews. You can plant them in the ground. They are super cold hardy, super heat hardy, 
And as I said, they have the same sort of color range and kind of the plant habit of a petunia. So if you're looking for an alternative crop to plant in those petunia beds, full sun, mind you, full sun, uh, this would be a good uh, a good option for you to consider. I think the next slide shows, Chris, the, the use of them in uh, some of the beds that we had here at Ball. That light blue color oh, is fantastic. Uh, it's a difficult color to find in plants for landscape, a real standout color. I was just asking uh, Jeff earlier, wouldn't that be a great alternative to adgeratum where it could mildew mm -hmm. out? That blue is really unusual. We always say there's no blue tulip, and blue yep. colors are tricky. It's, Although it's not blue in the traditional sense, it's blue enough. <laughs> Blue enough. And we're going to make sure they think it's blue. <laughs> um, so that is a great alternative, I exactly. think, to some I think of the other ones. So many color choices in so many of these these newer cultivars, or new uh, yeah, cultivars, um, that can serve to provide that variety. Absolutely. You don't always have to find a new crop. No. Give them a new color, a new palette. Right. Uh, so a lot of times you can interchange things, and that's why we were talking about developing your palettes early. Like instead of – you don't have to pick the plants. Pick your colors. You could say, hey, I'm doing a blue-orange-yellow year. Boom. You want your blues? You got your salvia. You got your endurascape blue. You want to do your oranges? Let's grab the Sun Patient Compact. At, uh, uh, lantana mm -hmm. and uh, maybe a zinnia right. and you want to do your yellows we could do like the lime you know the lime green coleus which mm -hmm. reads yellow you could bring in you know um, another different type of lantana a zahara zinnia and intermix those so you're developing palettes in advance and they don't have to be, oh, I'm only using a begonia. You can intermix all those and interplay them no matter what, you know, no matter Mix, mix, mix and match. Right. Exactly. We're, we're getting a variety of questions. We're going to get to all of them, time permitting, of course. But this one's right on the topic now. Verbena, how do you keep them blooming in the heat? Um, uh, they seem to have problems with thrips and leaf hoppers. Well, I'm going to argue the fact that uh, you may not be using the Endurascape. It's an altogether different <laughs> type of species, which would which by nature stays in bloom in the heat. So. My suggestion would be to try it and see if that works for you. I um, did use them in containers. I did pinch. I wound did you up. Pinch them? I sheared them. Kind of, I like tested it. I had them in beds and I had them in planters. And I, I'm like one of those girls that always wants to test run things before I order them in bulk. Oh, so I yeah, I test, I test ran them and. I pinched, I grew purple, and I grew the red, and I was able to shear them about mid-July, and I have a picture, and I could provide it for you later, sensational. End of July, all the way August, September, I mean, I think they In went the all September. the way to October, maybe yeah. even. So they definitely handled, you just need to give them a little shear, and you can just give them a haircut. You can just take your pruner and give them a little haircut, They and be like, oh, well, then what's happening? Well, you get a little green instead of a lot of color, but it'll come back quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gail wants to know if they're as prolific as waves. I would say maybe the easy wave, certainly not the original purple wave. Uh, well, as from our spreading. observations, they have been. I think what Melissa oh, yeah? is hinting at is if with a light shear, if you do see a color stall in right after the initial flush, yeah. uh, that will aid and abet a uh, greater, more consistent coloring over the course of the season. So maybe so, a good crop to rotate mm -hmm. uh, seasonally with waves. I would yeah. suggest, yeah. Wants yes. Big and bed. actually, that's a great, yeah. great flip-flop. There you go. Yeah. All right, moving on to lantanas, which is a big mainstay for landscape. Of course, the breeding objective here is getting them to stay and bloom longer later. Lantanas have a tendency to go uh, to seed is the day length starts to shorten, so there's ways that we can get at that issue on the breeding side. So successionally, we offer the little luckies. Historically, that's been more for the deep south, simply because they stay more compact. Our lucky series is sort of mid-Atlantic and up, and then the landmark series, which are very vigorous growers, uh, are kind of the, the, uh, the where we started. So the next slide shows how they can be used in landscape. And so as the size of the Little Lucky, I think, is what's unique. It can be used, you know, in many markets, lant lantanas would be considered a perennial. Um, these would as well. They have the same sort of a genetic background. But in most applications, we would be using them as an annual and rotating them out. And so the Little Lucky is a real good opportunity. Plus, it maintains its size and doesn't overgrow its bed. The well, lantana is a great one, especially on those water issues. I'll we'll move to the next section here. This is a unique new introduction called Jolt uh, Dianthus. It is a dianthus for the heat. Uh, it looks better later. 
So most dianthus we think of as uh, cool. spring yeah. bloom, blooming. This one is actually a summer blooming. And the next slide shows how that progressed here in the West Chicago conditions over the summer. So there on the left-hand side of the screen, July, and then later in August. So if you're looking for, I tell people it kind of looks like a phlox, perennial phlox, but it doesn't get the mildews, which is a good way to, to think about it. It has that same sort of color effect. Really interesting new uh, intro. Our cool wave pansies are also a great problem solver for landscape, and the next, because uh, they spread, Great in this application, probably the best. And I think, Melissa, you were saying earlier you're using these. In the I almost case. use these exclusively in planters because of the um, they're floriferous. So when you want a little cascade in the spring, they put on a really great show. I love the golden yellow. I'm using a lot of the blue skies this year, and the the violet wing is is super cute, and it looks really great with other yellows and silvers and things like that. It's, uh, it's one to seek out, and definitely one you need to talk to your grower about uh, having. Uh, I think we're coming, okay, to the Vinca series. So the big news in Vincas over the last few years is they've gotten much better because they're all hybrids now, or most of them are, uh, including our Vinca Titan. So they have bigger blooms and more vigor for the landscape. Uh, the next series that got introduced just this year is a series we're calling Valiant, which is a Comparison to the Cora Vinca, it's been selected to have greater aerial Phytophthora resistance. So somebody earlier was asking about Can Vinca. Can you say that again? Aerial <laughs> Phytophthora resistance. And this, <laughs> this is a shot from our research facility in Florida. The Valiant is on the left side of the screen in the foreground. The Cora is in the, on the right-hand side of the screen, so comparable in terms of performance. Our Titan is over there on the far left side of the screen and another variety called Vitesse is on the far right. So Vinca's in the deep south, especially in Florida, where you have high night temperatures and a lot of rain, you need something that is resilient, and that's what the Valiants are. So that's a very, very good addition. Kind of in keeping with that, I think the next item is uh, a new marigold. This one's kind of targeted for you south of the Mason-Dixon. This is a, a French marigold called Hot Pack, uh, and its deal is, well, next slide, Chris, is that. So our bonanza are on the left. Again, this is down in Florida. Our hot pack is on the right. So not in bloom in high heat in the summer, still in bloom in high heat in the summer with the hot pack. And that's that's the story behind the hot pack. So it's a great new uh, French marigold for the deep south. And that's a nice shape. I mean, that's a really nice mm -hmm. tight shape for the please, front. Yeah, it's kind of bad. Uh, the zinnias, down to the Zs, uh, the Zahara zinnia we introduced to several years ago, there's a taller type called Excel. Uh, the grape color or purple color is a really nice landscape option. Uh, the newest round is the yellow in the double form of the Zahara, uh, which is a nice uh, lemony yellow I color. Love that. Yeah. Should yeah. be a good one for landscape. So, uh, well, so to sort of summarize a lot there, um, you know, plants are requiring more interest over several months. We're mixing together flowers and foliage. We're seeing that mixed annual and perennial beds. You're probably seeing that too. A lot of that. I have a lot of clients asking us. And I, and I, and I, I suggest it sometimes. If you don't have, like, a key focal area and your client needs to save some money, put some perennials in there and then say, but let's keep that money and make your annuals even better. Even better. You know what I mean? Bigger, so, more yeah, vigorous. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Continuing on with this trends we're seeing, uh, perennials as annuals. So again, I apologize to those that uh, wanted to hear more about perennials. Hang with us. We're going to do that in the fall, or in August, rather. Uh, perennials are being used more as annuals, and, and uh, Ball has got a range of products that kind of fit that class. We're seeing a lot more flowering shrubs. Those are taking up more and more bed space. And uh, grasses and sedges are, and are really starting. Grass, and all of those are just like great foliage plants. Exactly. Like that. exactly. So advice from the pros. So, Melissa, what would you like to leave us with here? I'd say set the tone. You're in charge of your client's destiny, and your grower <laughs> needs you to get them your numbers. So develop your palette. Start with colors. If you're not sure, pick some, some of your favorites. How I personally do it, I pick 10 to my 15 favorite and make sure that they all will go in and out and play with each other. Um, and I think most important is to pre-book. You are, we are fashion. We are six months ahead of time. 
So as I was here earlier at Ball Seed in January and the buzz was crazy, it's probably a little more calm. They're wrapping up their, you know, end of the ship. But what, what your client needs to know is in order to get them the best, most custom-grown, lovely plants is you have to be prepared in advance. Exactly. So you need to guess. You truly need to take what you have, look at your ratios of who re-signs every year. Is your renewal rate 90%? If it, you know it's 90%, you should be booking, I would say, up to at least 70 to 75% of what you grew last year. So if you have this great renewal rate, what are you so afraid of? Talk to your owners, get out there. You need to take a little risk on yourself. And I think most growers that have access to retail folks as well will be able to move some things in and out if, it, if it's not the exact color scheme you were going with and just develop a palette, believe in your palette and sell it. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. So here's some uh, closing shots of some of Melissa's great work in and around the Chicagoland area. Again, there's that, um, actually that's Campfire Coleus. That's the traditional wax begonia. This client doesn't have a ton of money. That's good old wax cocktail begonia. <laughs> um, the perennials up in the front, that used to be an annual bud. Several years ago, we had um, some Ansonia blue ice planted in there with Cecilaria and Allium Summer Beauty. Looked great. It, it looks awesome year round. Um, so I think carrying some things over and doing that, and if you want to move on to the next slide, um, that top right corner is the first thing I see, which is a Panola blue pansy that was planted in a bed as an underplanting to bulbs. And so when the bulbs went, the pansies came on and it bought me enough time while I was doing all my other plantings in the end of May. I got to plant this site in June, which is what you'll see on the other beds. And I made a cardinal mistake of putting the Serenita behind the Hellenium <laughs> and had to flip flop it. So I, I wanted to show you that the Hellenium will be a little bit taller than that uh, Angelonia. So it's something to keep in mind. And again, those wave, those are wave, traditional wave purple petunias in there, along with Angelonia, compact orange, Impatience in the containers, and those later that year were absolutely stunning. A really great show. Beautiful work. And ah, the, there's the Ipomea show. Yeah, and the Ipomea took over that lobularia that was in that bed, which is fine, and it was able to create a great show. So um, you could actually, from the direction I'm taking, that you can't see the lobularia, but it is intermixed in between each one of those. So that was again with the um, begonias, and you'll see the cana. We carried over the Kim Queens. Um, we added some zinnia upper rows. In the f way backdrop, you'll see the um, canola canas in those beds along with um, the begonia whoppers, and really a, really a, a stunning show. Spring cannot come soon enough. Um, yes, sure. it can. <laughs> <laughs> We're busy, I'm sure. Well, as, as Jeff alluded to, we will be working on a, uh, a fall webinar where we'll get to those. We'll um, do uh, perennials, perennial. shrubs, and mums, oh, my, <laughs> and, uh, in September of this year. So please join us again. You'll uh, Chris will be sending out notices about and that And they actually later. now have resembled those guys from me talking so much. So I now am <laughs> sitting next to the Tin Man and the Scarecrow, and I'm the frightened young lady in the middle. <laughs> so a couple of reminders for some days there. You can meet us in person on our grounds here in West Chicago. We have a Darwin's Perennial Day on June 22nd. Uh, come and see us. All of our perennial vendors will be here. Our Ball Customer and Landscape Day occurs on July 29th this year. Uh, please do uh, click on the Ball Seed, uh, Ball Landscape uh, sites to find the uh, location of where you register for those events, and hopefully we'll see you this summer. Balllandscape.com. Balllandscape.com. I will be there. We, um, we do have a few random questions. Let's see if we can get to those real quick. Uh, Andy wants to know, Melissa, what can you recommend for uh, a pool deck, uh, ground beds around a pool? Pool deck, ground beds. Ooh, so my guess is it's tough, it's hot. I'd say you're... Maybe water. Maybe, maybe not. Well, maybe we don't know. So chlorine. Hopefully it's not chlorine <laughs> water. But I would go with the verbena. I think any of the lantanas would be sensational there. The whopper would work great there. The angelonia would do really well in that scenario. Um, I, I think any of those would be great choices. If you wanted to add a little bit of height, I would intermix that uh, cana. It's not too overwhelming, mm -hmm. the cana canova. It's only about three to four feet. And it looks great in um, bedded. And then I don't know; those would probably be my go-to's. The mm -hmm. nice thing about the canna is the sort of that tropical look. Yeah, it often works around totally. a pool and the height. Yeah, too, you can. So I like that. Uh, and Dan if you'd like to invite me to your pool, <laughs> I'll, I'll come. Bring your trowel. <laughs> right. Uh, Darren, Darren wants to know: Can sun patients grow in full shade? Uh, 
Yes, I, I guess I would say this. The bounce sort of has an advantage in more shade conditions. The sun patients may have a bit of an advantage in full sun conditions, but either they can go a little bit either way. So bounce can be used in full sun. Sun patients can be used in shade. Deep, deep shade, nothing grows. Really deep, deep shade. So I would coleus. not advise that. Gross. Well, sorry. Go yes. with coleus. the Kong. <laughs> the Kong can grow in deep, deep shade and some of the begonias. And I would that. definitely say put bounce in shade for yeah. sure before yeah. you're going to put a sun patient. They'll handle a little bit, but the deep, deep shade, that's where you want to start recommending some of your perennials and other things, honestly, because Eucharist, hostage. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, we mentioned Canis, but, but Kenneth has problems with Japanese beetles Ooh. on his. Um. Well, first treat your turf for white grub. Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> that's, a, that's a turf treatment. <laughs> so Japanese beetle, I don't know if everyone knows this, and I could misspeak, so if I am, stop me. But I believe they start as a white grub in the ground, and they yep. emerge, and they turn yep. into this lovely yep. chomping beetle. Yep. You need to... Make sure you're treating your lawns and your turf for white grub um, and or any other kind of things like that. And then once you see the Japanese beetle, you need to start actively spraying for them, unfortunately. If your neighbors aren't going to be spraying as well, talk to them because <laughs> um, that will help as well. Uh, and I just, you got to get them on a regular rotation. There's mm. Once they're there, there's not a lot yeah. you can do. Large leaf, large leaf ornamentals are... Uh... Easy picking for Japanese beetles. So. Or just introduce it as a new laced variety. <laughs> that would be my other recommendation. All right. And on, and on that clever and <laughs> note, uh, for those of you who <clears throat> had to sign off or who want to share this with uh, colleagues, clients, um, or uh, just rewatch it, ballpublishing.com slash webinars is where you'll find uh, all of our archives. And uh, again, I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, we're going to be doing more of these. You can always sign up at ballpublishing.com slash webinars and go to Ball Landscape. That's Jeff's website. Yes, indeed. If you uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about what they have to offer. Um, but I guess that's it. So for Melissa and for Jeff and for all my folks here at Ball Publishing, this is Chris Beatty's saying so long, everybody. Music.